what you want more than anything is you want to meet people with different experiences. And I've always sort of found you would see things that you would not automatically have come across. Hello and welcome to the Parliamentary Review podcast, the podcast that has a soft spot for raising standards. I'm Jonathan White, and in each episode I'm joined by directors, CEOs, CFOs, government ministers, chairmen, presidents, maybe one day even the President of the United States. Who knows how much longer he'll be around for. The aim is to discover who these people are, the people who get up each morning and make Britain work. We discuss everything from what the government should do to tackle the housing crisis to the NATO response to ISIS, and of course the innovation and success in the country that make it all worthwhile in the end. We also get their take on the current political and economic state of the country. Later on in this episode, you'll have the chance to hear our exclusive interview with Lord Pickles, former Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, Chairman of the Conservative Party, and of course current Co-Chairman of the Parliamentary Review. But for now, we're joined by Alison Hesketh, the director of Time Finders. Alison spent over 25 years as a charity troubleshooter, but it wasn't until her own mother found herself no longer able to manage the house that the idea of Time Finders was born. Determined to set the highest standards of integrity and transparency where no regulation exists, we discussed the help the company offers, both practical and emotional, and what needs to be done to help some of the most vulnerable in society going forward. Alison, welcome. Hello, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, it's been uh, a few months since uh, uh, Time Fighters has been in uh, the review. Uh, I think perhaps we should start. I know the listeners would love to know, uh, Alison, what you, the team and the uh, firm have been up to since. Well, since we came into the Parliamentary Review, it's been a very exciting time. Um, As I think I said at the time, being recognised for best practice in the best uh, for best practice in the Parliamentary Review really added to our credibility. Um, When we started Time Finders, we started a completely new profession, and so to be recognised by the Parliamentary Review meant that. people that we were working with suddenly began to take us a little bit more seriously. Mm. Solicitors and financial advisors, particularly who we were talking with, suddenly thought, hmm, this is a company worth talking to. Well, and, you know, I, I think the, the, the work you do is um, perhaps not uh, something that uh, many people would be aware of, that it, that, it, that it even exists in the first place. And I think for you, especially, Alison, the, the business is a very personal one. Uh, and it was created after trying to find help for your own mother. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, some, well, probably some, getting on for 20 years ago now, mm. I helped my mother downsize. Um, she was in reasonable health, but becoming a little frailer um, and wanted to move to somewhere more manageable. And like so many people, uh, I I was delighted to help her, um, threw the children in the car, jumped, you know, raced up and down the motorway to help her sort through a lifetime's possessions. Um, And so we had to cram into several weekends something that really should have been able to take much longer. But it it worked and it worked very well. And I thought no more about it. Um, And then when a friend came to me shortly after my mother died and said, look, I know what you did for your mother. Um, much as I love mine, um, if I have to spend more than half an hour in her company helping to sort out her stuff, I think I'm probably going to scream. <laughs> it, you know, is there anything you could do to help? And it was one of those light bulb moments. Mum mm. and I couldn't find anybody to help us when we were going through it. And I thought, well, we can't be the only ones. And here is my friend going through exactly the same process. And what's more, recognizing that sometimes very close family members are not always the best people to help an older person go through everything in their home because everything is imbued with emotion and history to do with the family. And sometimes that can make life very difficult for families, even if they get on terribly well. Um, and I think, obviously, it's for a lot of people, it's not something you'd even begin to think about until it happens to you, is it, as it were. And I think there's, an, there's a, perhaps a lack of awareness in this country, and I know you'll be able to uh, uh, go into a bit more detail about this, that 
uh, the challenges facing older people, older people that, for one reason or the other, have no one to turn to themselves, uh, mm. it, it exists very prominently in so many areas. Um, what, what, do you, what do you think uh, perhaps uh, people should know more about uh, uh, that they don't at the moment? Well, I think, first of all, it's the recognition that there are many, many people in our population who are ageing alone. Um, Britain, along with most other countries, only keep statistics on women. I think Norway is one of the few countries that keeps statistics on men as well. Um, and um, our Office of National Statistics say that one in five women born in the 1960s won't have children. Now, whether that's because they chose not to have children, they were unfortunately not able to have children, or tragically their children have predeceased them, mm. it doesn't matter. They haven't got children. And so much government policy um, seems to expect the family to step up. But if you haven't got a family to step up, you're left in an extremely vulnerable position. And of course, that. Those statistics don't take into account um, the cohort of the LGBTQI community who are now getting into old age um, when they were first, when they were young people. Mm. First of all, it was illegal. Uh, Secondly, they certainly weren't allowed to adopt children. It wasn't possible to have children. In many cases, they were estranged from their families, so they don't even have nieces and nephews to call on to to, to help them in older age. And I, I know that not only have you done extraordinary uh, work uh, with that, but uh, you've also, and again, it's not something that is talked about much, it's those people who might have family, but they are um, abroad, they could live, you know, the other side of the world. And I know, Alison, you, yourselves at Time Fighters have been very much involved uh, with that as well. Yes, we were very fortunate to be funded by what was then um, the uh, UK Trade and Investment. I think it's called Department of Business now. Um, in nineteen, in, in, sorry, in two thousand and twelve, um, just, just get the decade wrong, um, and uh, and and they they recognised that there was, there was a, a group of ex expats all over the world um, who had elderly and frail people back in in the UK that, that we could support um, and and we could be an advocate for or represent them when they weren't able to be present with their with their relatives and. Um, our, our very first expat client, because again, as we grew the business, we, we we became aware that there was more and more work that needed to be done and more areas to go into than we'd ever envisaged when we when we started Time Finders in 2010. Uh, and and the whole expat thing came up when we had a telephone call from somebody who said, look, I've got a little bit of a problem. Um, father's in one hospital, uh, mother's in a completely different hospital, but she's escaped from there twice <laughs> because she wants to be with my father. And social services has said, well, because my mother has dementia, she's got to go to one care home and my father doesn't have dementia. So they're going to put him in a completely different care home and they're going to separate them for the first time in 50 years. And that's going to kill them. Yes. Um, can you help? Oh, by the way, I, I live in America um, so, and I can't get back straight away. So, it, again, it just suddenly dawned on us that there was somebody the other side of the world desperately worried about what was going to happen to his parents and not being here and able to take control um, and help them in the way that he would like. Now, given the uh, the, the numbers, of course, you, you work with uh, in so many different circumstances... It's exceptionally important, no doubt, that uh, you can maintain a very personal um, approach to each and every uh, one of your uh, clients. How have you found, uh, 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 how easy easy is that to do? And has technology um, aided you uh, in that way over, over the last few years? Ours is a very personal service. It's it's dedicated and centres around our client and and whoever is paying the bill. In our minds, our client is the elderly person that we're supporting, um, and 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 so our our work is is 
is with them. Technology doesn't really come into it very much, except, of course, in our record keeping um, and making sure that if one of our team is developing a good and close relationship with a client, which is what's required in many cases, that if something were to happen to them, were they to fall under a bus? Mm. Then one of the rest of the team could come in and pick up and know exactly where they were, although obviously they would have to build that personal relationship again. Um, so, so no, te- technology for us um, doesn't help hugely. Mm. After all, if you're helping somebody to downsize, um, unless you've got a fantastic robot, which I don't think has been invented yet, okay. it's not going to help you go through every cupboard and every drawer and what's in the loft. and yes. I, I, in the garage and, it, and whatever. In an age of ever increasing reliance on uh, data and uh, technology, it's so important to remember that um, in certain sectors like yours, that uh, nothing really does beat a human touch. Um, no, absolutely, the human touch is is the essence. Uh, now, looking at the sector uh, more broadly uh, for a moment, Alison, uh, looking forward, where do you think the uh, main challenges are are going to come from? Well, um, I've got to mention the money word, haven't I? Um, there simply One of us isn't had to. enough. <laughs> there simply isn't enough money in the system. Mm. Uh, I think uh, there was a recent report done by the House of Lords that estimated that in order to get us back to 2010 levels, um, some seven or eight billion pounds has to be put back into the social care system. We're not talking about the NHS here, we're talking about the social care system. Absolutely. Um, and I think what isn't talked about enough is the fact that because people are not getting the help at the stage that they need it. That's actually impacting on the NHS in two ways. It's a pincer movement. Firstly, you've got a lot more older people going to hospital who shouldn't be going to hospital and wouldn't be going to hospital had they had the right personal care and social care. And secondly, you've got people who are stuck in hospital who who are ready to, to, to move, but they can't because there isn't the funding or there aren't the places for them to go to where they can receive the appropriate care. So mm. so the fact that the NHS and the social care system is separated in my mind is ludicrous. Um, and so many governments of all complexions have just kicked this into the long grass and we can't afford to do it anymore. And I, I mean, the, the, the problem is as well, Alison, that you're quite right Not only that, time is also running out because uh, we have, uh, as everyone will be aware, a growing elderly population. And it's a question of how much longer we can wait to do this. And I think the answer is really not much time at all. Uh, No. And and I think think it's all very well, particularly in this... um, this time of a general election for the parties to buy against each other saying, I'm going to spend this. No, I'm going to spend more than you. No, I'm going to spend more than you. You know, uh, Mm. throwing money at the problem isn't going to solve it. Yes, money is needed, but we need to spend that money wisely. And and actually, we need to look at the whole system. Somebody reminded me the other day that when the welfare state was started and the old age pension for men came in at the age of 65, Mm. the average life expectancy of a man was just under 66 and a half years. Mm. Now it's something like 86. It's it's, it's, when, when you put it like that, it really demonstrates perhaps how out of date some of our, uh, 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 systems are, as it were, uh, and serious reform is needed. And obviously, Alison, we are speaking in the midst of a, a general election, so that's everybody's Christmas ruined, obviously. But uh, in some seriousness, what would you hope to see uh, in the manifestos, especially from the, uh, the Tories and the Labour Party on, on this? I I would like them to to pay attention to that House of Lords report. It was I think it was published in July or June this year. Yes. Um, and and it came up it's cross party, it came up with some very, very sensible suggestions because and, and it was about social care particularly. Um, it was about the need for more money, it was about the need to spend it wisely, but it was also about the fact that care is provided by people. 
and we don't have enough people and we don't have enough people who are the right sort of people to be doing a care job because it is a demanding it is a demanding role. It can be the most rewarding role, but it can also be incredibly demoralizing. Mm. Um, it, and, and carers are paid very, very lowly. The status of carers in society, because they're considered to be unimportant. And, and when you think that, you know, a really brilliantly experienced carer could actually get more money working for the local supermarket, um, you know, maybe stacking shelves where they don't have any human contact at all. And we recognize that desperate need for human contact that our older and vulnerable members of society have. We have to raise the status of carers to get the right people in. It can make you feel quite ashamed, really, as a society uh, uh, when you think about it. And let's say, maybe this is a bit of an unfair uh, question, Alison, I'll put you on the spot. If, if you were um, Secretary of State for the afternoon, magic wand, uh, you could introduce a policy. What is it you think that should be done in the very near short term in terms of legislation that would really help out the sector? Well, I think I'd probably have to lock the Chancellor of the Exchequer in his office and not allow him or her to leave until um, he'd promised to uh, to fund the sector. I would be looking to provide, to... to um, combine the national health and social care. I know it's been combined under one ministry, but the budgets haven't been com- com- combined. I think the it's been pointed out that the areas of greatest need in the country are not necessarily those that have the greatest um, economy. And so therefore, local councils don't necessarily have good budgets. So there has to be an evening out of, of the budget across the country. Um, I would also listen to the people at the front line. Absolutely. It's very easy to stand at the sideline and say, oh, you should be doing this. But the people who are trying to find the right care, trying to find um, the people to do that care, are, are those the people that, that we need to be listening to. Um, now, uh, are there, uh, perhaps before we out of politics completely here. Um, are there examples uh, in Europe and overseas, further afield, of a country that really has got this right? I think a lot of countries are trying very hard. I think our Scandinavian um, neighbours do a particularly good job, mm-hmm. and they pay for it. Quite. Um, they 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 pay either through through taxes or through. Our equivalent, I suppose, of, of, of national insurance, um, and and the, and 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 the state pays for it. I'm not an economist. I don't mm. wouldn't like to say how things should work, but I think they are looking more creatively at our aging population and not just casting people out. You got to the age of sixty. You got to the age of seventy. Well, you're well, no, no longer a, yes. a useful member of society. You know, um, and and we know even from people who are from our clients who um, are, are are in a great deal of pain. Um, they or, or or they find mobility very difficult. They still have a lot to offer, and and just to cast them out is um, it's depressing for them apart from anything else. And we're and we're, we're losing this amazing resource. And it's lovely to see um, this intergenerational. Um, work beginning and it's coming into this country as well where you've got um, nurseries with very young children um, alongside um, residential homes for the elderly and the two generations come together and have the most wonderful time you're, you're and absolutely you find- right uh, and I, I know that uh, it was um, uh, I'll name them because uh, uh, down the road Tadpole's Nursery uh, in Chelsea they make sure that once a month at least uh, uh, the children go and spend the day um, um, with the elderly. And Mm. it's so important and they both learn so much from one another. 
Yes, and I think again, you know, we spoke at the beginning about the fact that, that, that families are dispersed now. We don't necessarily live around the corner from our parents. And so our children don't necessarily have that close relationship with their grandparents as we might have done or our parents' generation might have done. And I think that that misses out a very important part of, um, of, of, of growing up and developing. Um, now, but having said that, I, I was going to say, I was just coming back to this idea that we have this huge population who don't have a family, who don't have children, don't have grandchildren, um, and they have no one to take their part, um, you know, when when they need support. And now, it's, it's um, I wouldn't want to say it's getting to Christmas just yet. We're not that far away. I've seen I've seen the, the the John Lewis advert already, so I think that may, that might count. Oh, you've got one up on me then. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> it, uh, well, I, I won't see whether it's good or bad. That seems like I'd be promoting it. But... <laughs> don't, don't don't spoil the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as we do approach uh, Christmas, it certainly can be the most difficult time of year for those that are alone of any age, but especially the elderly. Um, what yeah. advice would you give? generally to people that are seeking that are looking to help out if they know someone uh of a certain age that they know won't have anybody to talk to on christmas day on boxing day i think that if you can open your door and invite them in Mm. inviting your neighbor or if you can't do that pop round in the morning with a card um, drop in for a cup of coffee. Bring your own flask if you're worried that you know they might not be able to get up and make you a coffee, and that might embarrass them. Um, but ask. Yes. Don't just assume. Some people want to be alone. Other mm-hmm. people don't. Some people, and we're talking particularly about a generation who are not happy with asking for help and yes. find it difficult sometimes to accept help. Stoic but people. The core, but the, yeah, the, the, the core of time finds when we when we started was, was absolutely person centred support, which means that we we listen to what our clients want to say. We don't assume that we know what they want mm. because they are the best judges very often. Now, looking at, I'm conscious of the time here, Alison, we could talk about this all day. I know, but um, <laughs> looking forward. Um, you know, Time Finders has done a superb job in in almost in almost a ten years now, uh, and I think uh, it's something. If only you existed across the whole country. But look, looking forward, uh, how how do you plan uh, uh, for Time Finders to continue to improve the quality of life for your clients and hopefully many more to come? Well, we 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 are growing. Um, since the parliamentary review was published, we've employed uh, another time finder in Middlesex, um, and we're looking to grow across the country. We've grown very carefully so far, very 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 slowly to make sure that our policies and our procedures are in place. And as I said at the beginning, when we started, we were creating really an entirely new profession. We're not regulated by anybody. So we wanted to make sure that the standards that we held ourselves to were the highest ones. Mm. um, So that anybody coming along behind us would say, right, that's what we've got to aim for. And I hope that we've done that. So we do grow carefully. Trust is at the heart of what we do. So it's, so our recruitment process is very detailed. Um, and what we're finding is that our work is changing slightly. When we started, we did a lot of helping people to move to somewhere more manageable. But now our continuing support, particularly our advocacy service, um, is I think is, is growing in momentum. And I think that will spearhead our growth, certainly in the next um, three to five years' time. Well, Alison... Uh, I hope we can speak again when the, uh, uh, perhaps after the general election, and we can finally see if there's a, a government with a majority, what their new policy will be on this, because we need one and we need uh, one fast. It's a pleasure. That would be very interesting. It's a pleasure talking. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you, Jonathan. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Alison, and especially learning more about the challenges facing the sector and how the whole team at Time Finders are continuing to raise standards. If you haven't heard it before, coming up now is our conversation with the Parliamentary Review's co-chairman, Eric Pickles. 
Lord Pickles served as Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government in David Cameron's Cabinet before receiving a peerage in 2018. Lord Pickles remains active as the United Kingdom's anti-corruption champion and the country's special envoy for post-Holocaust issues, as well as being a keen vexillologist. That's flags to you and me. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy speaking to Eric. Here it is now. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, Now, I'm sure you won't uh, mind me reminding the listeners that uh, you've been involved in politics, both local and national, for quite a number of decades. Um, Indeed, before we, the days we were in the common market. Um, You know, given your experience over those years, um, what thoughts have you had over the last few weeks and months about the current political uh, situation the country finds itself in? Situation is quite dire because we have um, a parliament that um, is by and large useless. It's like a bored teenager on a long drive, and um, it wants, it knows what it doesn't want, and it's so bored with Brexit, but it can't agree. So no matter what you put up, it's against it. Are you in favour of a referendum? No, I don't want that. Are you in favour of uh, remaining within the single man? No, I don't want that. Are you in favour of... No, I don't want to do that. No, no. And are you in favour of leaving without a deal? No, we don't want to do that. So it's against everything. But it, there isn't enough votes to be in favour of something. And it could be by the time this podcast goes out that... that uh, Boris has uh, started on the process of the bill because we'll be voting on that today. Uh, but even then, it, what people don't seem to understand, this is not the end of Brexit. Right. This is barely opening the door of Brexit. We've got years of negotiations about fight, about trade agreements, relationships with uh, with Europe, putting uh, putting down pieces of legislation. We get our agriculture, our fisheries, our financial services into place. Brexit is going to go on and on and, and, and sure on and on. To it. I'm sure we are. Um, now uh, the question is, I should actually remind listeners that we are talking on the day that the second reading of the uh, uh, Ruben Collect will. Uh, take place. So, as we speak, we don't quite know. As well, perhaps like the government front bench, don't know what's going to happen. Um, you compare Parliament to a petulant teenager. What do you do to a petulant teenager to sort it out? Um, is there a chance that it will see sense and push this through this bill without breaking amendments? Is there a chance it will vote for its own uh, for a general election? What do you, how do you see this playing out at the moment? The sensible thing would be to put this deal through because I've always been of the view a deal is better than no deal because this is just the beginning. In order to start the process of Brexit, start the process of uh, the United Kingdom taking over powers that it's uh, it's not really exercised for 40-odd years, the smart thing is to get this thing through now. But in a way, it's not about Brexit itself. If there was a free vote, this deal would have gone through. Mrs May's deal would have gone through. But it's about politics. It's about a Labour Party that thinks it has a chance uh, trying to make the Prime Minister, whether it was Theresa May or Boris Johnson, uh, look as though that they are uh, in office but not in power, of um, delaying as long as possible. There's a lot of talk about... um, an election uh, in the autumn, maybe back end of November, beginning of uh, of December, uh, something for us to look forward to before Christmas. It's beginning to look less likely. It's beginning to look as though they might want to drag it into spring to get as far away as possible um, from the rather decisive moment that uh, Boris came back with a deal. We have to remind ourselves that nobody thought he could deliver um, a deal and it does quite shock them and if you remember all this process went through in order to ensure that we were left without a deal when we have a deal suddenly, oh no, it's not that kind of deal we don't want that kind of deal we want something different I think the vast majority of people in this country whether they remain or leave uh, now would be very satisfied for this to come to a um, able conclusion and as correctly just said, 
um, because when it does come to those on, in the opposition you know, claim to want this to happen, and then to, uh, uh, introduce wrecking amendments, they introduce uh, new objections to it, the general public are getting quite frustrated. But you've got to understand that quite a lot of people don't get beyond a small area within Westminster, and sometimes cliche referred to as the Westminster bubble, and go back to their own patch. Now, by and large, everybody hates their MP, except when they're at home, doing the fairs, doing, you know, uh, wandering around, uh, helping people. So, they, in a way, they're cosseted to that great, which I s feels coming as a tsunami of change. I do, uh, of course, MP for Brentwood for uh, uh, 25 years. Absolutely. Um, what would you, I mean, of course, you resident there as well, despite being a proud option, obviously, representing a good Essex seat. What would you say to your, your old constituents right now? You hang in there, it'll be all right? Well, um, uh, you're, uh, it's different when you're a member of parliament because, you know, you've got to kind of toe the government line a little bit. So. One thing I found now is I've got my weekend back and I say what I want. And uh, I think I always say to um, our constituents is that it is pretty hopeless down there. Thanks, Maura. On that, I think, uh, honest assessment, it's something I think the Parliamentary Review has always done quite well, talking frankly about problems, issues, and also not just good practice but leadership. Well I always used to I mean I always used to read it when I was a, a, a member of parliament um, because I mean what you want more than anything is you want to meet people with different experiences mm -hmm. and I've always sort of found uh, it quite a, um, uh, a kind of a chatty magazine but also you would see things that you would not automatically have come across a certain of attended um, the receptions over the year and it's amazing the things you kind of pick up and I think it's important to stress it's not because uh, uh, politicians are, are uninterested because honestly as you will know more than anyone it's an issue of time and to be able to have a channel uh, and a platform where you can keep communication lines between businesses schools and policy makers it's, it's so exceptionally important no, I think so, and, you know, and it's important that it's beholding to nobody. People, um, uh, you know, pay for to be part of the publication, pay for to be uh, um, uh, members, and it's a way of not being holding to government, not beholding to anything. Uh, now, uh, you're echoing the words, of course, your fellow uh, chairman, uh, Lord Blunkett, has said. That some, what some might not know uh, is that you started your political journey, perhaps even further left than David Blunkett. Oh, absolutely, I was a communist. Now, uh, what, what, uh, what was it? At the age what? of 14, I got, um, I was bought um, the um, <clears throat> Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, and I read it from cover to cover. I tried to read it a few years back, and I just couldn't follow anything. Oh, so I was going to say, perhaps you might know the minds of the uh, show front bench Better than, better than they do themselves. From my position when I first joined, I would regard them as recalcitrant uh, <laughs> ruling dogs of the capitalist system. Now, what was it then that uh, moved you from radical Marxist to running uh, the only uh, inner city council controlled by the Conservatives in the 80s? Well, I was very young and um, I was fascinated by what was happening in, um, uh, in what was then Czechoslovakia and uh, Dubček. Um, the, the revolution that was taking place there inside communism and the way in which uh, he was uh, repressed by uh, Bre by, uh, uh, by Mr. Brezhnev yeah, and the tanks and taking over I was so angry and I'm 16 remember mm. I'm really angry I thought what's the most outrageous thing I can do um, I will join the um, I'll join the Conservative Party as a protest. And I kind of sticked around, and my family thought it was the funniest thing that ever happened uh, to it. I was Eric the Tory. And, um, well, I think you announced this quite grandly as a, as, a, as a grand protest. I did indeed, but um, do you know, I kept going down, and um, it, was a, it was an exciting time. Um, 
people developing the ideas of what the Conservative Party should be. Selsdon man, mm. even Heath looked radical. We had different ideas, and just it eventually clicked. And at some point, I became a Conservative, and that was fifty. One years ago, I think I'm definitely 100 percent a Tory now. Through and through. Through and through. Although I do know the story. Uh, most most uh, people might guess that a, 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 cons- a dialogue conservative like yourself would have perhaps a portrait of um, Mr. Thatcher or Mr. Churchill in their office. But uh, who is it that you have? That um, I Che Guevara. And then, uh, <laughs> which always I always had him over my uh, left shoulder. Of visitors, and they always used to kind of you see their eyes going up and thinking, Who you know, I can't possibly be. With. Someone asked me if it was Desi Arnaz, I thought it was um, <laughs> Patrick to Lucille Ball. But no, the reason I, I did that was to remind me and to remind my uh, officials that without constant vigilance, the cigar chomping commies would take over. <laughs> I, I'm sure David Bunk was in the room to reply to that actually. Um, but um, in, in, in that long journey, you eventually ended up, of course, in 2010, doing something most Conservatives would never thought they would have to do, but in a coalition government with the, of all people, the Liberal Democrats. That's right. Now, um, for something I think perhaps today more than ever, uh, people and our politics seems to be almost wholly determined um, on how we voted in a referendum three years ago. Yeah, I mean, the most normal thing would happen after something like that mm-hmm. would be the or be the country would come together. And if anything, we're, we're, we're more divided. I mean, I thought working in the coalition, I'm proud to have been part mm-hmm. of that coalition. Um, I'm proud to have worked alongside the Liberal Democrats, who I think realise that, like all minority partners in a, in a coalition, they would suffer at the polls. And do you think we've lost the ability uh, recently as a, as, a, as a people to work with those that we might disagree with on more than we used to. I'm not sure that's right. Um, I mean, you can see various members of the Conservative Party working closely with Liberal Democrats and Labour to defeat their own government. But it's not a thing I think I would want to encourage. Quite. Um, and I, I should remind this, we are recording this in Victoria, um, just over the road at Cardinal Place, uh, a fantastically new de- de- development site which wouldn't have been there without some of at your uh, legislation, what was the proudest? I personally approved it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What was the proudest moment you think in uh, serving secretary for five years? It's, um, my actual proudest moment. We did a thing called uh, Trouble Families, which was the first centre right uh, attempt to deal with poverty and to deal with mm. um, difficult families that were causing a disproportionately large amount of um, of, of call upon the. Um, uh, on the state and it was on the basis of tough love it's on the basis of getting people into jobs it's about dealing with uh, uh, the kind of the whole the family as a whole not just one or two individuals that, had a, that were having a problem and I'm pleased that it's continued um, and since I should very much stress that since of course you're uh, stepped down to being an MP you do have your weekends back but that's not to say you haven't remained very active and very um, uh, busy of course can you use government's anti-corruption uh, champion shone the harsh light of day over malpractice in the local government. Um, indeed, the Queen's speech we've just had includes some of uh, your recommendations from uh, 2016. Um, I think a couple of things on that. First of all, are you surprised? Um, I may imagine you may not be at some of the backlash towards in this country introducing uh, voter ID for voting. It is absurd, and it's particularly absurd coming from the Labour Party because it was largely Labour's vulnerability uh, that got my interest in trying to do something about it. And um, it's a bit like saying, you know, you're requiring people to show some ID, uh, that this is suppressing voting. It's a bit like saying the post office is suppressing parcels because they demand to see uh, uh, some ID. I think... um, They've got um, uh, a bee into their bonnet that this is something like they've got in the state to repress it. It's not. Mm. It's about giving confidence to the system. Now, the Electoral Commission and Foreign Observers have warned us for such a long time that our electoral system is vulnerable. And it's it's to misquote um, uh, John Major, we are really sort of old males 
cycling to even song and, and, and war bears. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a basic thing. It's an important thing, and it was kind of interesting uh, in some of the trials. Um, they did um, a focus group with a bunch of uh, young uh, Asian girls, and they said they thought the process of a photo ID would actually give them a greater confidence in the fairness of the system. I met and met all kinds of uh, recommendations to stop uh, postal vote harvesting, uh, to, for, to, to stop various fraud taking place, to stop um, intimidation at counts, to stop intimidation outside polling stations. And I, I think you referenced it earlier, the, the Westminster bubble, a lot of the, the places where this occurs and the places where this does go on are places where perhaps uh, many members, many people in the press don't usually go to. No, they, no I don't. Uh, uh, we saw a, a YouGov poll that said the overwhelming majority, well in the 60%, thought these, uh, this idea was sensible. Yeah, I, 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 I imagine you're quite proud that that recommendation is... Uh, in the speech. Yes, I mean, I'm a bit frustrated they didn't do it sooner, but it's, nevertheless, I'm very happy that it, they, they are doing it. It's as if the government's time has been taken up by something else and we're not focused on anything. Yeah, else absolutely. Um, but with a man, though, with his roots in uh, local government, uh, do you think, and, and how much he works with this, with that report, especially looking at them carefully, how would you rate our current state of local municipal politics? Local government's very good. I mean, local government, don't get me wrong, it's, uh, it's by and large corruption free and it, it does a remarkably good job. And it was, in truth, my worries about local government and that these measures were brought in. I don't believe the fraud is big enough to be able to take a parliamentary seat, but it is big enough to take a council. And if you are negligent, uncaring about the probity of the poll, you're likely to be equally negligent about the awarding of contracts uh, 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 to your friends. Uh, so it's, it's all part of that. But local government is, is, is a very enduring part of our constitution. I got a bit stick because we had to take some money from them, but by and large, they survive very well. Excellent. Now, uh, beyond um, obviously, uh, that work, you also the uh, British envoy for. Uh, Post Holocaust issues. Yeah, sure. I think very dear to your heart. Um, I know you've done some fantastic uh, work recently, including with the um, former Shadow Chancellor from the Review uh, in Balls. Um, would you mind, uh, if you could just let the listeners know what projects you are working on with that and, and really the importance that has to so many communities around the country? Well, I used to be very unpleasant about Ed Ball and he used to be very unpleasant about me, but I found working with him. Uh, remarkably easy and we've not had a, a single row in two years and by now we're beginning to be able to, to finish each other's sentences. We're building a, a memorial to the Holocaust so next to Parliament uh, with a learning centre below it and the reason why the Prime Minister chose that site is that um, it was David Cameron and he wanted to ensure that when people left the memorial they would look and see Parliament and recognise that it was the last bastion against tyranny. But more important, to remind people who work in Parliament that, that the legislature has a choice. It can either protect its citizens or it can oppress its citizens. And we do know that, um, uh, that it was a compliant legislature that brought in the Nuremberg uh, laws. And at a time when there are parts of Europe that are seeking to rewrite their history and seeking to see themselves as only the victims of the Nazis, I'm determined that we should tell the truth in an unblinking uh, way. Um, we are, I suppose, at a critical crossroads when the last survivor is likely mm -hmm. to uh, not be no longer with us within the next decade and a half. And at that point, we do know that um, uh, history starts to be reassessed. I think it was Simon Sharma that, that talked about this. And he was referring to the French Revolution. 
And of course, most of the books written in the 1850s are the ones that have uh, shaped um, our view of the French Revolution. But the difference is this, that uh, slightly over 100 years ago, my grandfather, Edgar, mm. uh, grabbed hold of his Lee Enfield and walked out of a trench in the Somme and walked towards um, the Germans. And within a few minutes, uh, most of the people who'd been, who'd been brought up with, most of his friends were dead. Nobody doubts that he did that. But there's a whole industry out there that doubts that the Holocaust took place. So that's why it's important that we help frame that narrative. And uh, and you reference as well, it's 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 so important, especially at this this time, this time of history of so many years afterwards, that uh, people, young people in schools get the correct education about it. How do we compare as a country in doing that compared to some of our European friends? We're, we, um, I think, compare remarkably well, uh, uh, particularly because we've got a mixture of things. Uh, we, ins we ensure through the lessons of Auschwitz that two pupils from every secondary school go to Auschwitz each year, uh, that they have a preliminary meeting, uh, a visit and a, a wrap-up. We ensure that um, Holocaust Day um, uh, is remembered in January, and I can remember starting that. So, or I'm not starting it, but being part uh, of a foot soldier of people that put it together. And you know, it was like one man and a dog, but now it's quite a, a massive, it's, it's a massive um, event. So I think we are quite good at remembering that. I think where we perhaps do need to have a wider understanding is beyond the death counts. And we need to kind of understand uh, the Anstatt group, which was the roving murder squads. Um, how um, important they were. You were more likely to have been shot in a ditch than to end up in a, in a death camp. Um, and uh, they, the interland of that is Lithuania, where I was uh, last week uh, talking to colleagues and through, through Belarus and the Ukraine. And it's really important that we ensure that we, we register where those death sites are. And I think... Uh, Certainly, uh, and I'm going to sit down next to speak, which hopefully won't be too um, long away. It's, and I think we'd be very happy to, to keep updates on how that, how that project is going, because it's so important and people do need to be aware of it. Um, looking to the future, though, um, I imagine people are actually very uh, content and happy. Former Prime Minister, friend and colleague David Cameron, just released his book, and you came you know, quite unscathed from it. I can't, it was very nice about yes. it. Um, I even bought the audio version because he was reading it and he obviously you know, but there was a fair bit of affection and, and, and I'm rather glad they left out one or two of the other embarrassing things <laughs> maybe not this time yeah. yes. um, but um, it's um, important I think uh, and I'm conscious of the time so, but I'm, I think it's important that today people have become so perhaps um, caught up in what's happening in this country regarding Brexit um, looking to the future, how would you, and what would you say that it's a positive thing that, that this country has to look forward to? Well, we're a large trade. We're a large trading nation. We're a large uh, economy. We're a liberal uh, uh, democracy, and it would be good to get through uh, Brexit over the coming years, and it would be good to start to look at some of the social issues uh, that we need to tackle, those that have been left behind uh, by our economic uh, uh, progress and it will be good to see some solid investment in this country, both in terms of its infrastructure but also in, in terms of the way it operates as a democracy. And I know that it can be a huge focus of the next review uh, and because thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. As always, it's been a pleasure interviewing and learning from our guests. I hope you all enjoyed listening. Until next time, I'm off to the cask and glass to raise a glass to raising standards. Goodbye.
Thank you for listening to our podcast. You can find every episode on iTunes, YouTube, and Spotify. The views expressed by each guest in the podcast are their own. They do not represent the opinions of the Parliamentary Review, Westminster Publications, Lord Pickles, Lord Blunkett, David Curry, or any other guest on the podcast. If you'd like to know more about the Parliamentary Review, please visit www.theparliamentaryreview.co.uk.